And yesterday we started with a little passage uh, from uh, First Timothy chapter 1, verse 20, uh, that is a, a very critical passage when it comes um, to pray and to intercede for not only for Israel, but in general of uh, our needs and uh, whatever is laid before us. First Timothy chapter 2, verse 1, we read the following passage. First of all, Paul says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made to the people for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God, our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. First of all, then, Paul says, I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all the people. And we saw, said yesterday, uh, just to recapitulate very briefly, that uh, this uh, commandment that Paul gave to his disciple, uh, he was uh, one of the earliest uh, con converts of Paul in the city of Derby. And uh, we read this in the book of Acts, he had a Jewish mother and a Jewish grandmother who educated him in the things of the kingdom of God. And uh, he reminded him in a way, so, you know, in your ministry, whatever I've said before, the most important thing, the first thing that you really need you, you need to remember is that you engage in a life of prayer and intercession. And uh, this is something I believe, which is uh, uh, a forgotten art in the kingdom of God, where uh, we know how to worship the Lord, we know how to sing praises to the Lord, but many times uh, churches has still have stopped having prayer meetings, intercession meetings, where they are praying and interceding for matters relevant to their affairs. And Paul says this should be the first priority. I urge you to do that. We saw it yesterday that this very first word, supplication, that is used here, it's the Greek word, the aces, it actually means need. And we saw yesterday that no matter what our need is, no matter how big, how small, what type, what nature our need is, God expects us, he wants us to bring those needs before him. And it was such an amazing uh, um, experience yesterday when we prayed for the needs of the people and there was this avalanche of needs, hundreds and hundreds of needs that were pouring out here on this uh, Zoom call where people said, yes, I have this need, please pray for us. And of course, it's uh, one thing for us to pray for that, but God is encouraging you to pray for your own need and to bring those needs before the Lord. And uh, what I would like to ask you, even if you have been, if you have been praying yesterday for something particular, please inform us. Please let us know if the Lord was answering those prayers. If you had an experience where you said, "Yes, we prayed yesterday, and today we already see a change." Of course, I understand there were uh, many issues like uh, self salvation of children or financial breakthroughs or health issues. You might not sort that out from today to tomorrow, but please uh, uh, let us know that if the Lord was touching you, the Lord encourages us. Pastor Stephen Mirpuri was reading from the book of Philippians where it says, don't be afraid, don't be sorrowful, don't be anxious about anything. Whatever bothers you, bring it before the throne of God. And as you do that, the peace of the Lord will govern, will reign your heart um, and protect you. And it's quite an amazing passage, actually, if you go there and if Philippians chapter 4, the world, the peace of the Lord will, it's not, not only governing, it actually the Greek word indicates it will be like a watchdog uh, surrounding your heart, protecting it and uh, safeguarding it that the peace of God remains in your heart as you approach God in prayer. So uh, the first part, the first word that is used here, supplication, we saw it, it's a very specific word that also is used in the context, not just of prayer, but 
people bringing their needs to politicians and government leaders. And they say, we have this particular need, please help us. And the Bible uh, 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 encourages us to bring those needs as a first address to God himself and say, Lord, please help me. You see the need that we have in our life. And by doing so, we honor uh, the Lord. Now, the second word here says, first of all, I urge you that supplication and prayers being made. Now, the word prayer the uh, the the Greek word is prosuki. Uh, I hope I pronounced that correctly. I'm not a Greek expert, but I'm using using uh, my smart computer Bibles that give you all kinds of good information about those things. And uh, what the dictionary, one of the dictionaries, is telling us is that telling us is that uh, this word really is being used exclusively in the Bible only to express. Prayer, meaning you talk to God and you bring your needs to God. It's not used. You don't pray to politicians. You don't pray to other people. Uh, prayer, this this world is really, really the spiritual world that we also have. Um, in Germany, you would call it Gebet, or in English, you call it prayer. It is something that you direct directly to God. It's your communication with God, so to speak. And it's not just relevant. And for um, for bringing your needs and your your requests to the Lord, we saw yesterday the Bible really encourages us to do do so. But it's a much wider expression. It includes also intercession. Prayer can in include also that you worship the Lord and that you exalt his name. It's your communication. It's your daily uh, devotion that you have with the Lord. And I want to read you a number of those passages in Matthew chapter 17. Uh, Matthew chapter 17 in verse 21, we read the following Matthew 17 verse 21. Um, here we go. Um, verse 21, let me find this here in my Bible. He said to them, because of your little faith. Yeah, the, the story here is that Jesus comes back from the Mount of Transfiguration. And after this ex incredible experience up on the mountain, they come down to the valley. They find a demon-possessed young lad. And the uh, um, nine disciples that remained down in the valley, they try to cast out these demons with everything they learned from Jesus. And nothing world. They used all the formulas, all the prayers that they heard from Jesus. Uh, and they talk, you know, what can we do? What else did Jesus do in such a situation? And then they see in a distance Jesus and the three disciples coming down from the mountain. And I can just see them, how they run to him and say, Jesus, you really need to help us. There is a problem. We couldn't solve it. You send us once out and it all worked and we cast out demons. We heal the sick, but it somehow doesn't work in that case. And Jesus comes down. First of all, he rebukes his disciples. He said, you know, you really, you have little faith here. He went to the boy, just uses one phrase, he commands the spirit to be uh, uh, cast out of this boy. The, the spirit immediately leaves him, is thrown to the floor. The boy, the boy is, is healthy and restored back to his father. And then the disciples come to Jesus and say, oh, this is amazing. Why couldn't we do that? We tried everything that you have been teaching us. We tried every practice. It didn't work out. And this is what Jesus says. He said to them, because of your little faith, Matthew 17, 20. For truly, I say to you, say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. And then it's, it adds here, but some Bibles, they don't actually put that, but in says here in, the, in, in some of the old Greek versions, it says, but this kind never comes out except through prayer and fasting. 
Now, what, what Jesus means by that, I think this is a very important lesson that we get here. He says, you know, it's it's not that Jesus now said he came down from the mountain and assembled his disciples. He says, you know, guys, this is a tough case. Now we need to have a, a time of prayer and fasting, and then we can deal with that issue. I believe what rather Jesus said here, he says, in order to have a certain level of authority, in order to deal with some of the tough issues of this life, you need to have a lifestyle of prayer and fasting. Prayer and fasting need to be part of your daily life, need to be part of your regular Christian walk with the Lord. And as you have this lifestyle of prayer and fasting, the Lord also adds the authority to you that you can deal with issues like that. And uh, what the Bible here tells us is that, that uh, it already gives us a key why prayer is so important. It says prayer, actually, as you spend time with Jesus, it not only changes something in heaven, of course, uh, it, it will um, accomplish something in the heavenlies. We read this in many passage passages, but the much greater effect that prayer has is that it changes something in our lives, and it puts us in a place how God can use us in a greater measure than before. And that's what the prayer, what prayer is... Uh, uh, this word, uh, prosuki, uh, is being used. There's another passage, Matthew chapter 21, verse 30, in a very critical passage. Jesus says, my house shall be a house of prayer. And, you know, if we think about many of our congregations today, how much prayer there is going on how about in our worship places, how much time do we really spend in prayer? Uh, we, we we do a lot of activities there. We might have nice banquets and coffee meetings and all kinds of things. But the primary purpose why God says, by the temple in Jerusalem was being built, said it's a place where people can talk to God and where they can have communion with God, where God wants to meet with his people. And of course, the temple of God, we are now the temple of God and the church is that, but uh, that's where prayer it should be the characteristic of the church today. Um, in Luke chapter 6, verse 12, you know, people say, you know, I, I don't really need to pray so much. Jesus himself, Luke 6, verse 12, we read he was all night in prayer. That means he was spending all night speaking to the Lord. And, uh, you know, I want to suggest to you very strongly, if Jesus as the Son of God had the need to spend the whole night in prayer with the Lord, how much more do we need to spend time with Yeshua and need to pray with him? Um, in Acts chapter 3, verse 1, and that's all the same word that is being used here. And you see it's used in a more general term. Acts chapter 3, verse 1, it says the, the apostles went to the temple at the hour of prayer. That means there were fixed times in their lives where they were going into the temple to pray and to seek God. And let me ask you, uh, are there those fixed times in your lives um, for prayer and seeking uh, the, the Lord? And then in Acts chapter 6, verse 1, we see that prayer was a key point of the characteristics of the early church, Acts chapter 6, 1, it says that the apostle devoted them to prayer and to the ministry of the world. world. This was the time when the early church was appointing deacons that took care of the daily activity of the business of the church, providing food, providing social need to the people, so that it's not good for us as the apostles to deal with those matters in order to have more times to devote ourselves to prayer and to the study and the preaching of the world. And if you are a minister, I said this yesterday about John Wesley. He had a very high demand on his disciples. I'm afraid I wouldn't make it really to be one of his uh, leaders. He says, I will take only people as pastors who will who are willing to preach at, uh, to pray at least three hours a day. And I want to encourage you today that, you know, if the Lord is speaking to you today to 
to rediscover prayer in your life, to spend, uh, to make a point, you know, like the apostles, they had an hour of prayer where they went to the temple to seek God, that you have in your daily routine and your daily calendar a time of prayer where you are seeking the Lord because it will change your life. It will increase the level how God can use you and you will see also that God uh, that God will bring forth amazing answers to prayer in our lives. Now, the first time that prayer is being used in the Bible, it actually is used, uh, and I think we already guess who it might be, it is by our father Abraham. Abraham is the very first person where the used that the word tefillah um, is being used, and this is in chapter uh, in Genesis chapter twenty verse seven, where Abimelech is being asked. He says, "You know, you have this uh, uh, sickness upon you that you brought upon you because you took Abraham's wives." Uh, uh, thanks God, the Lord protected them that he didn't come too close to her. But he says, "Go to Abraham, and he will pray for you." And that's for the first time we read that somebody was approaching God in regard to a certain need, at least where this word prayer is being used in the Old Testament. And I would just want to close that with a few comments on the Hebrew word of prayer. It's the word tefillah or lehit palel. And it's quite interesting, you know, the word lehit palel. It is a, a word that exists only in the reflexive grammatical form. Now, what does it mean, reflexive? It, reflexive, it means that it, uh, it's a, a verb type in, uh, in Hebrew, that if you do something, you actually do it to you. The most impact uh, you have is uh, it's, it's on yourself. You use this, for example, if you put on your clothes or if you change your clothes, lehit ba, lehit ba, 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 lesh, lehit ba, Lehit Labesh, exactly. I'm happy my wife is here to, to help me. Lehit Labesh. And these are words that it are reflective, reflective, reflexive in nature. That means it is something where you do something to yourself. And that's what I said in the beginning. You know, as we spend time in prayer with Jesus, time in the presence of the Lord, uh, the biggest impact actually is not so much on the heavenlies, it's much more on our own life. And this is, I believe, what Paul also said says in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 is that we spend time with the Lord. We are being transformed from one measure of glory to the next measure of glory. And so it's a reflexive uh, noun that is being used. And if you go to a, a dictionary, there are some quite good ones around that you can study in. And they really can't agree on what is the real root of the meaning of lehit palel or the 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 um the the the, the basic root of this this word palel. What does it really mean? And I found in different dictionaries actually seven different suggestions, and it shows you there they they couldn't really agree on that. But as I was reading those suggestions, I actually felt probably all of them are true. <laughs> Let me just give them to you because they really, in a way, they they tell us what um, um, what prayer is all about. Now, one one scholar. Um, uh, I think it's his name. It's one of the the oldest Christian dictionary in Greek. His name is Krim, was a German Orientalist. And he says it comes from the uh, Arab word fala, and it means to break something. And I think that's a fantastic idea because prayer is really the thing that brings you a breakthrough. Uh, it's a thing that if you need something where well, the Lord breaks through and intervenes on you uh, on your behalf, prayer is a perfect place for that. Now, others say, well, it comes from the Hebrew word from nafal. That means you prostrate yourself before the Lord. I think that's definitely also something what prayer entitles that that entitles that uh, as you approach the Lord, you humble yourself before the Lord and you tell him, Lord, I come to the end of my wisdom, the end of my strength. Please, I need your help. I'm humbling myself before your presence. And that's what prayer is. Uh, the, the next one, it's uh, they say that it comes from the Akkadian Palalu. 
And if you see here, there are so many different suggestions, but I liked it. He says the Akkadian Balpalalu, this uh, Greek um, uh, linguist says, because it means to guard or to watch. And it's quite interesting that in particular, the New Testament, in particular, Jesus, he uh, encourages us, he says, watch and pray. That means by praying, you are this, this is Isaiah chapter 62. You see it here on the top um, left corner of your screen. It's, uh, that's the name of our Isaiah, of our prayer initiative, uh, Isaiah 62. I have set watchmen on your walls, which shall never let you rest. And so it makes a lot of sense that it could come from the world to watch and to 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 guard a city. Uh, then it's it some said it comes from the world to cleave, to break, to separate. Um, and uh, to demand judgment, that means you separate light and darkness, and that's something that definitely you also um, um, will do in prayer. And then another one, which says that you appraise something or evaluate something, and you bring something in front of the Lord in prayer, and what you do, actually, you evaluate it. And some, so many times I experienced this even uh, when, you know, sometimes you pray, you have to say, you have to be very honest here, you pray sometimes for foolish things. <laughs> As you engage in prayer, the Lord actually tells you, well, I don't think this is worthwhile of your time to pray for that. There are some other things things that I need you to pray, or he might remind you and say, say you know, you ne neglected that one situation, but if you pray for that, uh, you can advocate to that and you can bring forth a change as you pray. So um, prayer, and that's again, you know, that's the second part of what I want to share with you here from First Timothy. It needs to be something that needs to be a daily routine of our lives. Some people say it's the, the breathtaking of the soul. And uh, it is definitely something that strengthens our faith, that changes us, that increases our faith and expectations to the Lord. And I experienced this so many times that when you are downtrodden and you have a difficult situation where you feel there is no much, not much hope in that situation, but as you bring those matters to God in prayer, that you see there is a change in that situation, and also you feel a change in yourself. I have said this many times in 2015 when uh, um, the doctors gave uh, uh, this uh, devastating diagnosis for my life, and they literal, literally told me that there is not much hope. And I went back home from the hospital with my wife, and uh, I remember sitting on the evening on the sofa when I came home from hospital. My children were crying. We were crying, Vesna and I. And I thought, well, these are the last few weeks that I have with the family. And the only thing I knew to do, I actually didn't have much time to pray, or not time, yes, but not much strength to pray myself. But I called our friend Yuha, who was at that time the international director, and he says, Yuha, the only thing that really can help me is prayer. Please send out a, a prayer mail to our people that they should pray for me. And let me tell you what this prayer did with my wife and I. We were waking up the next morning in the same situation, same living room, same apartment, everything was the same, but it was like somebody was switching, a, a turning a switch around. The house was filled with an atmosphere of expectation and faith, and our children that were crying the evening before, they came to us, Daddy, don't cry anymore because Jesus is going to heal you. And uh, Peter remembers we had the most astonishing prayer meetings during that time, and we felt really how Oh, prayer, of course, the, 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 you see me sitting here, that's the answer of the prayer, but it also did so much to ourselves. It changed us, it transformed us, and it was an amazing time in the presence of the Lord. Yeah.